Okay, I'm really glad that you have joined us again for our Leading Yourself Learning Experience. And it's our desire that we do not just pass information from our head to your head to where it just builds your knowledge, but it's our desire that in the midst of what we are bringing to the surface would lead you to interaction with Christ, interaction with His Word, and we would have follow-up discussion where there is interaction with God's people. That's really what walking in the light to the best of our knowledge and ability is all about. We need daily encounters with Christ, daily encounters with His Word, and we need frequent encounters with God's people. So these moments that we're having together in this platform will hopefully drive you to experience Christ, drive you to experience His Word, and facilitate an opportunity whereby you can dialogue, communicate with others who are walking through the same thing that you're walking through. Frequent encounters with God's people. So as we begin today, we're going to actually talk about uh, expectations, but based on, if you're looking at your learning module, you'd go to page five, and on that page you'll find four areas, one being commitment, another being conviction, another being competency, and the last one being character. It is on the character of a pastor that the culture of the church is developed. Now, did you, did you catch that? It will be on the character of the pastor that the church will be developed. In fact, I've heard many um, leading pastors leading equippers of pastors say that churches take on the values principle and sometimes even the personality of the pastor. So the truth of the matter is you as an individual, you as a pastor, provide the foundation on which healthy church is experienced. Healthy pastors are the foundation of healthy church. The foundation of a healthy church begins with a pastor. So how does a pastor become healthy. Healthy pastors begin with personally interacting with the Lord. You're going you're gonna to find that. You're going to find it right here. This is the center. This actual uh, illustration is what you might call a concentric circle where that this is the center. You've heard the song, Jesus, you're the center of it all. You are the wheel within the wheel, as the prophet said. So 
Loving the Lord is where we began our healthy foundation in order to lead a congregation, lead a systemic and structural uh, ministry based on the character that we are experiencing as we love the Lord. Then you're going to find you love the Lord and it's going to begin to spread out. You might not be able to read these, but this would say loving your spouse, loving your children, love expressed in the community of faith, and then love being expressed or imparted in the community. Much like what we would find in the book of Acts when Jesus had said to the disciples that go back to Jerusalem and in Jerusalem you will be Watch, endued with power from on high. Well, what, what happened? As they were there, watch, ministering unto the Lord. As they were there in praise and worship, watch, they were loving the Lord. God did something transformational in their lives. And that's, that's what I'm talking about, is that when we are busy about loving the Lord, interacting with Him, worshiping Him, okay, crying out to Him, giving Him praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving, as that's occurring, we are relating to Him, we are loving Him, and He is doing something in us just like He did with those disciples in that upper room. And He said, He said, once you are endued uh, from, or, uh, by the Holy Spirit with power from on high, it, it, it's Jerusalem, it's Judea, it's Samaria, it's the uttermost parts of the world. And think about this. These disciples may have not been 25, 35, 50, maybe a hundred miles from their hometown. And now Jesus has said, you go here and I'm going to do something transformational in you that's going to impact all of Jerusalem, all of Judea, all of Samaria, and eventually the entire world. Now, that might be a little um, concerning to someone who had not been 25 or 50 miles away from their hometown, thinking that they were going to impact the world by what they were having. Listen, I'm telling you, when we love the Lord, it begins to spread out. It impacts our spouse. It impacts our children. It impacts the community of faith. Ultimately, it, com it, it impacts our uh, uh, community, our, our county, our city, our state, our nation, and ultimately the globe. Think about that, what God does in you works its way out and makes a difference. But it has to start with you and God personally. So I want you to read this with me. Look at this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Now watch this. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. He went on and said, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. 
Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That's the message. Does that sound familiar? I'm going to give you a moment to let that germinate in your mind. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out? Come to me. Get away with me. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Learn the unforced the rhythms of grace. Unforced. See, when, when we are, watch this, when we are loving the Lord, you following me? When we are loving the Lord, unforced rhythms of grace rise within us. It's not like we're working hard to do what's right. It's when we love the Lord, there is a rhythm that begins to occur. <laughs> okay? It just begins to happen. It just begins to occur because He's not laying anything heavy or something that does not fit as you keep company with me, he said, loving the Lord, as you keep company with me, you will learn to live freely and lightly. Do you know what passage of Scripture that might be? I think you probably do. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Watch, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What a promise. The unforced rhythms of life. You see, we have a tendency to work for Him rather than working with Him. That's why Jesus said, Come to me, yoke up with me, watch, learn from me, learn of me, interact with me, <laughs> do as I do, okay? Let's go back, let's go back, let's, let's look at it. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. When we are loving the Lord, when we are interacting with Him, there is a dynamic of relationship that happens inside of me that drives me, that inspires me, that moves me to love as the Lord loved to lead as the Lord led, to care as the Lord cared, to be compassionate as the Lord was compassionate, to minister as the Lord ministered. And as I am yoked up with Him, <laughs> He's bearing the burden. He's carrying all the weight. I'm just in the yoke with him. And that's why serving as a pastor should not be hard. That's why serving as a follower of Jesus should not be hard because we are leading ourselves 
as we are to be yoked with him and as we are yoked with him <laughs> it's not heavy it's not ill-fitting because his yoke is easy and his burden is light and I want to tell you I know the burdensome feelings of pastoral work. I know, I know when they come. I've experienced those. But it's much like what we talked about in session one. Job went through what he went through in order to reveal to himself what was inside of him. So if I'm weary, if I'm worn, if I'm stressed, if I'm overwhelmed, it could be that I'm working in and of myself rather than working with him. Listen, let me give you, let me give you a statement. When you, are, when you are yoked with Jesus, you may get tired in ministry, but you will never get tired of ministry. See, if we become tired of ministry, it's probably because we're working ministry in and of ourselves, rather than being yoked with Him. Because He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He said, you, 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 you're going to rest. See, so immediately, immediately people begin to think, that what you're saying is you don't do anything. You don't have anything to do with it. You're not, you're not working. That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that as we are properly yoked with Him, it's not hard for me to serve you as a pastor. It's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not struggling. I'm not weary. I'm not broken down. I'm not losing sleep. My blood pressure is not elevated because I'm so worried, so stressed, so concerned about uh, doing what's right in your behalf. When I'm yoked up with Him, there is, watch, there is an unforced rhythm that is easy because of his gentleness with me. And so when I have experienced his gentleness, I lead with that same character. So let's look, let's look at this as we're leading ourselves. Leading yourself leads to leading others and leading teams. Okay, but remember, if I'm not leading myself back to the center of loving the Lord, then I'm probably not going to lead others or lead teams well. You following me? Our commitment will lack, our conviction will lack, our competence will lack because our character is lacking. Remember, healthy churches are built as healthy pastors equip healthy leaders to do the work of ministry. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 that he, Christ, gave apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Pastor, you're going you're gonna to be overwhelmed. You're going to be uh, weary. You're going to be broken down. You're going to be burdened down trying to do all of the significant ministry in your church. Because God did not design for you to do it all. God placed people around you for you to recognize they have gifts, they have callings, they have passions, and for you to connect with them 
and pour into them what he is pouring into you as you are loving the Lord, then you then love others by pouring that which the Lord is pouring into you into them. They then pour it into others, consequently following that concentric circle model that started with what is essential and moved out to hundreds, thousands, and even millions of people. Our commitment, I want you to think about that for a moment. Are you, as a leader, fully surrendered, submitted first to the Lord, secondly to those over you in the Lord? Are you surrendered? And see, when we look at that, we have a tendency to think, okay, well, because I'm, I'm, I may not be as committed as I need to be, so we probably need to have a commitment service and we'll recommit. How many commitment services have we been to? How, 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 how many services have we held to try and get people more committed? The truth of the matter is, if we will lead others as He is leading us, if, 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 if we will lead them to experience the Christ that we are experiencing, not just a historical Jesus, but a contemporary Jesus. You see, I'm just wondering, are, are, are we talking more about Jesus of history than we are talking about a Jesus in the here and now? A Jesus that walks with me and talks with me. A Jesus that's in the fire of the furnace when I'm in the fire. A Jesus that's in the middle of the storm when I'm in the storm. Are we talking about those things Maybe not, and maybe it's because we're not experiencing them to the point where that we can share them with others. Because you see, it's as we have experienced Christ, and we then begin to lead others with what we have experienced, we are equipping them as we have been equipped and they then equip others as they have been equipped but we're all telling our stories so the stories that might come from a minister of the gospel a pastor of a congregation a state bishop as they are shared to the pastor then the pastor gets his own stories, has his own encounters, has his own experiences, and he shares his encounters, his experiences with the leaders of his congregation. You see what's happening? It becomes very personal. It becomes very contemporary. It becomes here and now rather than what used to be. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that sometimes we talk more about what the church used to be than what the church is right now. And maybe it's because we're not experiencing the church in the here and now like the Bible laid out that they experienced back in history and could it be that we may not be experiencing the church in the here and now like they did back then because we're not loving the Lord we're not centering ourselves we're not ministering to him we're working for him rather than yoking ourselves with Him. So our commitment, are you clearly surrendered to Jesus? Do you clearly have convictions that are founded in Scripture and not just personal preference or personal convictions? You see... Things that are your personal conviction may not be biblical.
convictions. Okay? You may have a conviction that you could not do a certain thing, but the Bible doesn't give clear direction as to if anyone could do that thing. So, those are things that the Scripture tells us as leaders that we should not lead someone, watch, to sin against their own conscience. Because if we lead someone to sin against their own conscience, their own personal conviction, that action that they would engage in that we convince them they then would be condemned because they were acting against personal conviction. But you cannot take that personal conviction and apply it to me. So as pastors and leaders, we must find what it is that the Bible lays out for us and how we should live. How we should live lead and live in that manner leading ourselves leading others leading teams then as that happens our competency is being raised i've got people in my life that challenge me challenge me in almost every conversation i have with people that i look to for accountability. I look to for enrichment to my own personal spiritual formation. They are challenging me to be more than what I was the day before. They are opening up areas that maybe I've become blind to because of my positions on a tradition that I've held. But they're challenging me. That's the reason that it's really important to have people in your life that are not always yes people, that tell you yes no matter what you say, no matter what you do. But have people that you are working, doing ministry with who might not agree with you. That would challenge your thinking, challenge your way of ministry so that you are developing more and more and more into Christ. And then ultimately our character. So let's talk a little bit about our character. Let's, let's, let's look at this just a moment. Expectations. You see, here, here's the expectation. Here's the reality. This is, this is the reality over here. This is where I'm at. This is the expectation. There's a huge gap. There's a, there's a gap there. Expectation is I want to. Reality is but. That's, 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 that's dangerous. So let's, let's talk a minute about expectations expectations. You see, there are expectations of people or maybe expectations that you will have of yourself that are frivolous expectations. Frivolous expectations. There are expectations that are trivial expectations. And you, you have to know, as a pastor, there are unbelievable expectations on your life from the people that are around you. And if we live to meet all of those expectations, certainly we're going to find ministry that is burdensome, ministry that makes us weary, ministry that drives us away from our calling rather than into our calling. Expectations that are frivolous. Expectations that are trivial. Expectations that are cultural. Cultural expectations. 
Because I am an American, there are certain cultural things that the American church has become. And I, 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 I want to say that the things, there are some things that the American church has become, they have become institutionalized while that God is calling us out of the institutionalisms of today into becoming a church that is driven by Holy Spirit, that is driven by loving the Lord, driven by our our intimate connection with the Lord Jesus Christ, not just our cultural experiences. Then there are denominational expectations. Certainly, as a denominational leader, I, I have expectations on you as a pastor, and I've, I've given you a ministry description about those expectations. There are denominational expectations. There are legitimate expectations that people have, that they are certainly legit, that they are uh, things that we ought to consider as we are serving people. Then there are self-imposed expectations where that we, um, it's, it's kind of like I had an a instructor one time say that um, for every minute you are in the pulpit, you should have um, studied one hour. So that would mean that if you preached a 45-minute sermon, you would have had to study 45 hours. And some of you who are my vocational pastors are thinking, that's impossible. I couldn't do that. I couldn't study. Uh, well, your sermons probably would get shorter if you tried to live by that. Watch, self-imposed expectation. Then there are expectations that are positional expectations. Positional expectations. Then there are expectations that are unrealistic expectations. Then there are uh, expectations that are uh, certainly unfulfilled. That we've had expectations and we've, 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 we've never moved from reality over to what we have expected to experience. Maybe you went to a church thinking that this church was immediately going to explode. It had what you thought were all the right elements for growth. And you thought it was going to be busting at the seams in two years. And in two years, you're not any further along than you were there. That is an unfulfilled expectation. But it may be that that unfulfilled expectation is reality because we were expecting something that was not a part of what was God's plan, or we had just had this expectation because of some unhealthy feelings we might have even about ourselves. Thinking that, well, I'm such a good pastor, this church is going to go from 25 to 50. I'm such a good preacher, it's going to go from 50 to 100. I'm such a good administrator. Are you, you following me? Sometimes our unfulfilled expectations are because of our unrealistic thoughts about ourselves. That's why Paul said to think soberly. Watch. Righteously. Not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Expectations. Those are expectations that people have. But what about biblical expectations? Let's look at them. Let's look at them. Go with me to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Are you there? Biblical expectations. Now watch what, watch what Paul says. Saying this to Titus. For this reason, I left you in Crete. He's getting ready to tell him why he's there as a pastor. Paul assigned him to Crete as a pastor just like 
I've had the opportunity to assign you as a pastor in the location that you serve. Now watch. That you should set in order the things that are lacking. Watch. And appoint elders in every city as I have commanded you. You see that? Sometimes we think that all we are supposed to do is preach. All we're supposed to do is just conduct a service on Sunday, uh, our Bible study on Wednesday. But according to this instruction from Paul to Titus, he says, you need to set your church in order. You, you need to appoint elders. You need to appoint leaders. You, you, need, you need to establish systems and structures within your church so that, so that those systems and structures will work in a manner that will support the function of the church. You see, it's like we are, we are the body of Christ. And if we are the body, this physical body has systems and structures in it. The structure that I have is a physical bone structure and it provides definition for this body. It's what makes this body uh, 5 feet 11 or 6 feet tall. The structure, the bone structure. And the structure of your church will determine how large your church can become. That's why I talk so much about broadening the base of your leadership to increase your capacity for ministry. Structure has to be in place. Then the physical body has systems in it. I have a digestive system, a reproductive system. I have a circulatory system. I have a neurological system. Okay? All of those systems... If they are working properly, this body functions well. But you let my digestive system stop working. You let my renal system stop working. You let my circulatory system stop working. The function of my body begins to shut down. So it's really critical for you as a pastor to set things in order. Appoint elders, but don't just appoint them to fill a hole. Appoint them because they are passionate, because they are uh, driven by integrity with the Lord because they are gifted to serve in that capacity, not just because you need someone to fill a hole. Find out what the gifts and the callings and the passions of the people around you are and then equip them, place the tools in their hands for them to be leaders, elders, uh, workers in the church, and then set up the systems and the structures that would support that kind of ministry. Now, that I could spend, in fact, as we go through these learning modules in the coming year, year and a half, there's one specifically given to systems and structures. Four sessions we'll talk about systems and structures. So let's read on. Verse 6. Here he's getting to what an elder, what a pastor ought to look like. And I'm, I'm just telling you, every time I get in this passage, I am driven to tears. Well, maybe I shouldn't say every time, but almost every time I am driven to a place that says, God, I so want to be this man. I so want to embody the character that this man is. Listen, this man... For a bishop, or excuse me, if a man is blameless, this is what I've been commanded, to be blameless, the husband of one wife, 
having faithful children, not accused of dissipation. The, the King James Version says dissipation or debauchery, debauchery, okay? Or insubordination. God, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. Now watch. Holding holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine, watch, both to exhort and to convict those who might contradict. Those are biblical expectations. All of those other things that we listed, frivolous, trivial, cultural, denominational, legitimate, self-imposed, positional, unrealistic, unfulfilled, are secondary to these biblical expectations that we've just read. The one blameless, not faultless, not sinless, Certainly I say this with many people. I've said this in, in an instructing time that I am perfect while I'm getting better. Those two things don't match. Rationally, they do not connect. How can you be perfect and get better? Well, certainly I am perfect in my position with Christ because I am what I am because He is who He is and He has done what He has done. And He's ever living to make intercession for me. But as He is ever living, He is working in my behalf. He is working in me to transform me into the fullness of His image. So in that way, I'm getting better because I'm not what I used to be, but I'm not yet what I'm going to be. But I, I am unaccused, irreproachable is what he's talking about there. Then he talks about the husband of one wife or that would be a one-woman man that I'm not looking around. I have a wife, and that wife is the wife of my youth that I've been married to for almost 42 years in just a few days. And I love her more today than I ever had before. Before I met her, my eyes were constantly wandering, looking, looking, looking. Might she be the one? Might she be the one? At many times, there were many different girls that we would date. Many different guys that she would date, but when we met the one, that one kept our attention. So the man that is a bishop, an elder, a leader, must have his focus on one wife, on one husband. Faithful children faithful children. Listen, I can tell a whole lot about a man and a woman, about their home, as I look at their children. It certainly isn't without error because husbands, wives, mothers, and fathers 
can at times do everything that they know is right to do, have a loving environment whereby those children are raised. But the truth of the matter is, children make their own decisions. So you could not say that every child that was outside of their alignment with God is a reflection that something was not right in that home. But certainly I can look at children and I can tell those children have had someone pouring life into them. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, if you are pouring life into the children in your home, you're also going to pour life into the children of your church. He tells us stewards of God, stewards of God, managers, trustees. Listen, you are a trustee of the gospel. You are a trustee of the funds that are placed in your bank account as a church. And you are held accountable for those funds, how they have been spent, who they have been spent on, God help us to be true. That money is not your money. It's God's money, but you are responsible for God's money. Even your own personal bank account. That's, that's not, it's, it's not, sometimes we have a tendency to think that 90% of that is ours and 10% belongs to God. When in reality, 100% of the money that's in my checking account belongs to God. And I am called to steward that money well according to the values and the principles of God and His kingdom. A steward. Then to not be self-willed or self pleasing, not to be arrogant, not to be quick-tempered, prone to anger. <laughs> you get that? Prone to anger, quick to react. As a younger man, I was quick to react. I was a reactionary guy, but I have learned to be slower to speak and swifter to hear that it's not always my knee-jerk reactions that are the best. So a slower response may reflect more of the wisdom of heaven. Not given to wine, not driven by wine. That's what he's talking about. One who sits long at wine, one who is drunken, one who has become quarrelsome. You see, that's the reason that Paul said again, to be sober, uh, to think righteously. Okay, He's doing that, he's saying that because when you are under the influence of something other than the Holy Spirit, you will take on a guy way, way bigger than you, thinking that you as a four-foot man taking a nine-foot giant will bring him down. But that's the wine speaking, that which is in you. But when it's the Holy Spirit within you, those nine-foot giants fall, even though we're four feet. Okay? But don't be given to what Don't be driven by wine. He goes on and he says, not not violent, not violent, not a bruiser, not a bruiser, not ready for a fight, not looking for a fight, not pugnacious, not contentious, not quarrelsome. He goes on, he goes on and he says that we should not be greedy for money. Oh God, if there's ever something that kills a pastor today, it is money. It is money. That, 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 that we want more, but the reason we want more is there is an attitude of greed and God is saying that the man that is a overseer, the man that is a pastor, an elder, a leader in a church should not be driven by the love of money. This man should be hospitable, generous to people. 
He must be one who is a lover of what is good. He must be sober-minded. He must be just, just in the, in the broad sense. He must be upright. He must be righteous, righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. He must be holy, not holy in and of himself, but holy in and of Christ within him. He must be controlled and driven by the power of the Holy Spirit that works within him, strong because of the strength of God, robust because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on and he says, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, cleave to, paying heed to. <laughs> let no man, listen, let no man turn you from the word of God. Then he says, you need to be able or powerful, mighty, strong, mighty in wealth, mighty in influence, strong in the soul to bear through calamities. Then he tells us, exhort and convict. The word exhort there means, is, is a Greek word that means parakaleo, parakaleo, that's the word, but it means to come alongside I'm afraid that we take the word and we're not using the word to come alongside so that people can experience the word. We're taking the word and using it as a, uh, a tool to beat truth into someone rather than bring the word, come alongside of them and walk with them through their struggles. Convict means to bring to light, but not bring to light in that it is condemning, but bring to light in, you know, I believe you could experience more if you would experience this in life. I believe you could experience more if you would dot, 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 you see, that's convicting. That's bring to light. That's what the Holy Spirit does within us. And as He's doing that within us, the relationships that we have with others, Holy Spirit works in us to bring things to light. You see, there are times that God brings those things to light um, within my own relationship with Him. But there are times where that I have ignored that voice of the Holy Spirit and then God would send someone that would raise that to my awareness. <laughs> See, that's the, way, that's the way God is. God always gives us an opportunity to correct what's inside of us by Him raising it to our awareness. But if we fail to allow Him, uh, or, or maybe I'll say it this way, if we fail to agree with His evaluation, He loves us enough to bring someone alongside of us to bring that same word that we might be healed. Are you, are you following me? I, I hope so. Biblical expectations are fulfilled. As Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in me. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Listen, when you are loving the Lord, when you are worshiping rather than worrying, filled with gratitude rather than grumbling, loving God. There is power within you to where that these biblical biblical expectations flesh out of your life. 
And my prayer is that as I've shared with you today, you will be moved to experience Christ, experience His Word, and now as we experience God's people, as we discuss what it is that God is raising. I'll see you in just a few moments.